Oh, okay. Hello, uh, my name is Roberto Desimoni. I manage strategic innovation at BA Systems Applied Intelligence. And we're here today for a panel that is going to be exploring quite a few interesting topics on how we can overcome technical manufacturing and engineering challenges in harnessing of the power of qubits. Um, just before I introduce the panelists, uh, my role at BA Systems is to explore how we can exploit quantum computing. Uh, and I'm also a, a visiting professor of quantum system engineering at Loughborough University and also a Royal Society entrepreneur in residence within the quantum engineering labs at Bristol University. So I've been looking at quite a lot of issues regarding the system engineering aspects of quantum computing and other quantum technologies. Um, so uh, we're going to be covering quite a few topics in this area. We've got a few questions ready and later on in this session we'll be opening this up to others uh, who will have the opportunity to ask questions to the panelists. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass over to our three panelists to get them to introduce themselves, tell you about what they do, where they come from, and any initial thoughts they might have on this topic. So let's straightforwardly go over to Sadiq, uh, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you, Roberto. It was a pleasure. It's great to be here. Um, so my name is Sadiq Hafizovic. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zurich Instruments. Uh, Zurich Instruments is a company we started 12 years ago as the maker of the world's fastest lock and amplifiers and that has brought us close to quantum computing early on. So since 2015, so it's five years now, we are developing quantum computing specific instruments. And from our very early days on, we have worked closely with Andreas Valerov at ETH and Leo Di Carlo from TU Delft, today with many more people in the entire world. And what we do is we help build the quantum computer. We offer the entire electronics level of the quantum stack as a commercial product. And by this, we permit people to instantly move this level up to the state of the art that is defined by the leading groups worldwide, uh, which is otherwise uh, something that would easily take years. And also, I'd like to say, even though electronics may sound like PCBs and cables, and that's included, a major big effort goes into software, into providing the APIs also towards the upper levels in the stack, being compatible. That's something, interfaces, APIs, that's becoming more and more important. Examples are Qcode, Slabber, Qiskit, along these lines. Looking forward to the panel. And uh, I'd pass on to the next one in line. The next person is uh, Freika. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Freke Heijman. I'm the lead of Quantum Delft, the ecosystem in Delft, and uh, also the coordinator of the national program in the Netherlands. Uh, I have a double affiliation. I work for the Ministry of Economic Affairs in The Hague. Uh, therefore, my national uh, uh, head, so to say, and uh, I have an affiliation at QTEC in Delft where I work uh, for the quantum ecosystem to grow that further locally. Uh, well, I'm looking very much forward to this uh, panel because I think it's at the core of the challenge that we are facing, how to uh, develop uh, the quantum computing stack further. And it was just last month on the 20th of April that we launched uh, the Quantum Inspire, uh, the first European quantum computing stack available in the cloud. Uh, and I think that is uh, also something that is uh, the biggest challenge. There is no silver bullet in my, in my view to solve the engineering, engineering challenges. It's the entire stack. Uh, and that is why it's so important to work from applications, from software, to the control electronics, to the calibration, to the fabrication, to the qubits. So you need to work uh, on all of those to improve uh, the yield of quantum computers. 
Great. Okay. Um, shall we go over to uh, Tobias for an introduction from him? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tobias Lindstrom. I'm a principal research scientist at the Department of Quantum Technology at the National Physical Laboratory in the UK. So, as you might know, MPL is the National Measurements Institute for the UK, and one of our mission, one well, part of our mission, is to serve as a link between academia and industry. Uh, and in this context, it's help means helping um, commercialize emerging technologies such as quantum computing. So within the quantum technology department, uh, we work on both iron trap based uh, quantum computers and superconducting qubit based quantum computers, and I lead the work on the latter. So my team work on, I guess, three different strands, uh, all related to, to efforts to scaling up superconducting quantum computers to, towards practical applications. So uh, we work on basic science. Um, a lot of that is based on uh, looking at different issues related to the materials that are used to make superconducting qubits and eliminating defects, impurities, etc. We work on qubit metrology, which is about which is all about how we actually measuring qubits and in a standardized way that's reproducible, how you report the data, etc. And last but not least, we also work on instrumentation, um, and that's specifically cryogenic instrumentation that can work at sort of the bottom of the dilution refrigerator um, and measure some of the quantities you need to measure accurately in order to build um, a scaled up quantum computer. And I'm really looking forward to the panel this afternoon. It's going to be very interesting. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, three of you, for introducing yourselves. Um, uh, I think we'll try and just open up some questions just to explore the topic in a little bit more depth. And maybe to just try and introduce it. Um, my organization, BA Systems, is a is a big defense manufacturer. Um, and we use an awful lot of technologies to develop our complex systems. Um, they're very intrigued. They're all very intrigued at where quantum has a role to play in fitting in with our existing systems. So from quite a lot of my engineers across the organization, they're asking me the question of where does quantum fit in and how can we engineer a more complete solution where quantum is just part of that solution as a hybrid system? And in order to do that, um, what, what are the system engineering principles? Are there any principles there to how to fit quantum in? Are there standards? Are there metrics? Um, so um, the question I'd like to sort of put to, to, to the panelist is, what's your feel for the current state of the art of, of the state of engineering of quantum within systems? Um, so uh, let me start with uh, Sadiq. Um, any thoughts you have on, on those issues? Yeah, that's, I believe, uh, a really good point. And it's also a point that I believe in academia is way undervalued, the point of system integration. And when I look at projects, research projects that are going on, I believe in each and every one I have seen, the system integration point of view point was always underestimated and one of the factors that is dragging projects. Um, and I think what's unique to the quantum computer is uh, we don't really have a department or place where we can put the entire stack in. Because on each of these levels, you are so close to the limits of the respective technologies, be it the quantum processor, the electronics, or the software, uh, that, that you really need specialized teams for that. So something that um, we're now doing is, at Zurich Instruments, we have a mock-up of an entire quantum computer, except for the cryostat, because that's a bit pricey to operate. And it is really important to, that we test the entire stack, that we make sure that things go from software and trickle down the entire way and up, because otherwise it will cause delays. And those, those interfaces and APIs that are there, they are so young and they are so uh, fast developing still that essentially every time you have to, you have to, if you don't test the system, it, it will not work. If you don't test, it will die. Um, so having said all that, um, 
from an engineering point of view, I, I think we're just starting out, we're getting there, and I see big progress going on. And one is, for example, with with Quantum Inspire, which was mentioned by Freke. Another one that comes to my mind, there's a startup in Finland called IQM. They are aiming at selling a quantum computer, and they just started recently, I don't know, a year ago or something like that. And their way of starting is they are already able to buy a lot of that quantum stack off the of the market. For example, they get the fridge from Blue Force, they get the electronics from us, and their main job has now become doing the quantum processor and the system integration. So, and I think that's a new development as compared to say Rigetti. When Rigetti started, um, he didn't have this supply chain. He was starting from scratch and he developed his own uh, electronics. So I see the system integration point just by itself is becoming a really good value generation point. And I think IQM is just showing us that, that that's happening. Okay, um, uh, Freika, anything you want to add here? Well, I think uh, we work very closely with Zurich Instruments and also I'm very much uh, echoing or uh, it resonates with me what, what Sadiq is saying because uh, I the entire stack needs improvement. So it's not only the qubit, but it's also the cryogenic engineering. It is the software. It is the uh, control electronics. It's the calibration techniques. It's everything really needs big advancements because we are still in very early days in this uh, new technology. And I think uh, our uh, uh, view is that uh, it's not one player that can do it all. It's It it needs to be an interaction, a collaboration, and uh, a sort of an ecosystem approach that would advance innovation uh, the fastest. Because uh, if you have small players around uh, this stack uh, all working on the same problems, then you also have sort of a uh, Darwinistic approach where the best solution wins. And that is sort of the way we look at this. And therefore also uh, we see a lot of new players entering the stage. For instance, uh, uh, we have a new startup called Orange Quantum Systems that is taking up this role Sadiq is mentioning, the system integration role. Uh, and there's QBlox that is making the control electronics uh, a bit like what Zurich Instruments is doing. And then there's Delft Circuits uh, who developed the cables. So, uh, and of course, there's also still a lot of science that needs to be done on very various qubit types uh, in Delft, but in other places around the world. And uh, when this field advances with all these new companies uh, popping up in Finland, in Paris, a recent announcement in Paris, uh, in the Netherlands, then we see a new industry emerging and hopefully uh, in future we see a new quantum computer, maybe f from a European uh, perspective, uh, developed here. Thank you, Freika. Um, Tobias, uh, w what would you like to add? Well, I mean, I agree with what's had, um, already been said. I think coming from an NMI, one thing we encounter is um, when we now speak to this emerging industry, which is mainly made up from SMEs, um, typically an SME is specializing in one thing. And in order to create value for their customers, they then need to collaborate with other SMEs or other larger, you know, larger organizations. Um, and one thing that keeps popping up now um, is the, the need for um, standardization. Ultimately, that could be standardization in by ISO, and Senelik and organizations like that. But even before that, we get to that point, the need to be, you know, we see now this organization trying to agree on, say, common interfaces. So you have a software company writing quantum software, and they want to be able to run that on, on the machine made by another company that's made the hardware, and these two things need to talk to each other. In addition to that, you then start including, you know, maybe Zurich Instruments or some other supplier of electronics and that also need to fit into that chain. And these old bits need to fit together. And that is, I think, it's going to be a challenge because 
not because it's inherently difficult, but because it's going to be a bit of a culture shock, especially for people, you know, Amanidis SMEs are created by people who people come from academia, and they tend to be used to doing, you know, their jack of all trades to do a little bit of everything, everything from software to, you know, the hardware bit to, you know, soldering. And suddenly, you have the system integration challenge, but you have lots of different bits. They all need to talk to each other in a way that sort of makes sense and, and that can be scaled up. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, all three of you, for answering those questions. Um, I want to just probe a little bit more on on some of those issues. I think that came up in terms of design and test, evaluation and standards. It appears at the moment as if most of the work in in the area of standards and on maybe some of those interfaces is happening more ad hoc. It's um, interesting groupings between uh, different collaborators, whether it's startups, maybe big companies and academia. And so we're starting to get um, some really nice um, explorations of interfaces. But and it's I, I would say it's like as if it's happening bottom up rather than top down. Um, do you, first of all, do you agree that it or, or what were your thoughts on? Do you also believe it's more? bottom up rather than top down or are you seeing instances where some of these issues are being explored in a more top down manner um i'm going to go a slightly different order i'm going to actually ask tobias to just start and then we'll work our way through what are your thoughts on that tobias we are seeing um you know there are ongoing efforts by say ieee which is most of their efforts are, are focused on, on um, the US, uh, but also by ISO, uh, Sense and Elect to create international standards. Um, at the moment, this is very, very early, you know, early days, and we typically the first standards are probably going to be more about, you know, agreeing on terminology, what is a qubit, and so on, and later on on metrics. So I think it's going to be a few years before we have any um, real international standards when it comes to, to interfaces. But at the same time, we're also seeing, you know, efforts, as you said, you know, where especially SMEs are spontaneously sort of, you know, organizing, you know, by talking to, to um, and collaborating. And for example, here in the UK, there's uh, an Innovate-funded project that you started called NISC OS, which includes, um, I'd say, most of the hardware companies in the UK working on everything from ion traps to photonic qubits to silicon qubits, uh, as well as software companies. And the, this, the whole point of this whole project is to um, create a, a software platform that goes that makes it possible for someone, an end user, to sort of program something at the top level, and then you can run the same algorithms on on different machines, being it an iron trap machine or a circular like qubit based machine. Um, and I, I, I'm aware of similar efforts in other countries. So I think it is happening, uh, and I think it's probably coming both bottom up and top down. Uh, but it's going to be a few years before they sort of meet in the middle. Um, okay, great. Um, Freika, what, what would you like to add? Well, I think uh, uh, it is natural that at this stage of the technology, things happen uh, bottom up mostly. So I think in the last years, you see a lot of this, uh, what you are mentioning, happening bottom up, for instance, in projects in consortia, for instance, the IARPA or flagship programs where uh, the entire stack is being developed or the quantum inspire or uh, things happening within companies in the US. Uh, in Delft, we are trying to do that in this, uh, as I said, this ecosystem approach. Uh, but of course, when uh, technology matures, there is a need to, to come up with uh, standards, uh, also a bit more from a top-down uh, approach. And I think, well, we see it happening a little bit because uh, I know in Europe there is a, a, a new uh, industry uh, platform being developed and also our uh, uh, standardization uh, institution already is in this committee to develop standards for quantum computing. So I think the first steps are being taken, and I think that's important. But uh, this bottom-up way of working also has great value because it allows the best and the most innovative uh, uh, 
innovations to, you know, pop up and become the standard. So I would not uh, support to to act top down too early because then you can get into a political uh, uh, way of working as well. Uh, that's a, that's a very good point, Freika. Um, Sadik, uh, what would you like to add? Yeah, first, uh, I agree with everything that has been said. Um, maybe one point that uh, I'd like to add here is on the uh, software interfaces and how the standards, what I see, how things are happening there. And I quite like what's going on, and I'd like to point out how IBM is uh, working on Qiskit. So Qiskit is a uh, higher-level uh, software package framework, including many components, and it needs to talk to the lower levels of the stack. And IBM is a big company, and the approach that they have chosen is very community-based. So Zurich Instruments, as a company, we are also in very close touch with them and collaborating on where we need to improve in which direction the APIs have to move. <clears throat> and it's us, but it's also many other players in the community. And so in a way, it's uh, it's bottom up, but it's, it's really a lot of community co consensus involved there. And that is very promising. And we are actually uh, part participating a lot there. We're, we're doing a really active role there and trying to make sure that these APIs that are defined there will be lasting and useful for for everybody below and above this uh, interface line of software and hardware. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll probably come back to some of those topics and going in a little bit more depth a little later on the panel, but I wanted to sort of bring up some other topics. Um, and in particular, uh, what you might see as some of the greatest engineering challenges in addressing issues and problems such as temperature, noise, stability, longevity, let's say, of, uh, of some of the quantum systems. Um, so I'll actually leave it up to you to explore what do you see as some of the greatest challenges, um, some of those engineering challenges, either in in engineering a solution or in manufacturing devices or in running devices. Um, I'm gonna to go to Freika first and see what, what you see are some of the greatest challenges. Pick whichever ones you, you, you would wish to. Okay, yeah, well, I'm not the deepest expert uh, on the qubits themselves, but if you would ask me, uh, the scalability is, of course, the, the biggest uh, challenge, uh, I would say. Like having a few qubits, having 50 qubits, that's something completely different than having a thousand or tens of thousands or millions of qubits. So uh, the scalability uh, uh, really needs a lot of attention. And when you look at scalability, of course, there's the whole thing of error correction uh, uh, and fault tolerance that needs attention, but also uh, the electronics, because if you look at a qubit system uh, of 50 qubits and you see the number of uh, control electronics and wires, et cetera, needed to control it, uh, then, uh, well, there needs to be a lot of work to yeah, make it more efficient and smaller. And so that I think that is scalability is a big challenge and also the uh, development of the applications themselves, like what are real life problems that we are going to use the, the these computing platforms for like will there be a NISC device that will have a real life application maybe not but maybe uh, in a few years from there you can have applications for instance we are working with Shell uh, our big oil and gas company on artificial photosynthesis uh, and more specifically, chemical storage of solar energy. Uh, maybe a quantum device can have added value there. And we are working with uh, Rijkswaan, uh, it's a big company in horticulture, like uh, seed breeding, for instance, tomatoes and, and cucumbers, etc. And there, a big challenge is the prediction of uh, the, the uh, characteristics of genomes and 
quantum machine learning could maybe have added value there. So I think it's in, uh, well, developing the hardware and scaling it up, uh, but also in uh, uh, finding good applications and efficient algorithms to use the machine for. Thank you, Freika. Um, Sadik, um, I wonder whether you'd like to uh, amplify more on some of those key challenges, which ones you see as the, the, mm -hmm. the greatest engineering challenges. Sure, sure. I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge, and that's uh, very clear, is, is the quantum processor. I believe if anybody had a quantum CPU with 200 qubits, uh, we would get the electronics and the software sorted out in a fairly quick time. I'm not saying that is easy uh, or that it's it's actually difficult, but we know how to do it. We, we know how to do it. Um, but to really come up with a CPU with a quantum, with a qubit, with, with say 200, 500 qubits that actually work, that can be interfaced on, on whichever technology, be it superconducting or semiconducting, uh, that's clearly where the challenges are. And the higher levels in the stack, yes, we have a ton of challenges there as well, but there we have a much better idea on how to tackle them. And we are doing the electronics. At Zurich Instruments, we have a clear roadmap. We know exactly what to do to make, say, a 200 qubit system. We have the technology that scales there. And again, it's not easy. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of engineering that goes into that. But we know how to do that. Uh, OK. okay. Um, Tobias, what, what would you like to add? Well, I'm possibly quite biased since this is what I'm sort of working on, but one of the fundamental challenges we have for all, I would say, not just for the superconducting qubits, which I am working on, but for all the solid state, state systems, meaning including the semiconductor based solutions, is the material science. Um, because if you take, you know, the best qubits being reported at the moment, you know, made, you know, T1, so 300 microseconds and so on, that's much, 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 much better. I mean, they are many orders of magnitude better than what we saw just a few years ago. And if you had this qubit and you managed to make, you know, a, a thousand of these with identical performance, you could probably build something that's, you know, that would work and that would probably be scalable. But we're still having issues with reproducibility and fabrication. We're having issues with just sort of not quite understanding when something goes wrong, why it's gone wrong. Um, and there's, and that's, we know that it has to do with the materials. But we, we need to keep in mind that even though, we, um, say, the CMOS process has been developed for a very long time and they are very well understood, we now typically work in a very different regime. We're working at much lower temperatures, we work on much lower power. And we were encountering some physics that we're starting to get a handle on. Um, but there are still open questions there of how you actually overcome this reproducibility challenge. How do you make the materials clean enough? And I think that's probably going to be what we're going to be struggling with for the next few years. Um, I, I'm, I'm confident we can solve these problems, but they're going to need um, well, we need probably need as a community. We need to focus more on these things because so far we've been made, managing to avoid them to some extent by clever engineering. But I think we now hit the point where we just have to solve these problems once and for all. Yeah. Um, just following up on that, Tobias, um, how how do you see that um, sort of detailed? investigation of those, some of those more specific challenges. How will you see that happen? Will, do you think it will continue just um, as we explored earlier on in a more sort of ad hoc relationships between players or, or, or would you think that will happen a bit more top down? I think the, you, you probably need a bit of both. I mean, I can see, you know, I could, because many of the things we're discussing now should probably be done, you know, the system engineering and system integration and the engineering challenges. You know, you need to have maybe not, maybe not um, solely, but, you know, a lot of this is going to happen in the commercial sector. So it's going to be done by companies or maybe by consortia, including companies and, and, and academia. Um, so some of the material science, though, is probably still the type of research which is probably still can be done at universities um, and, you know, other academic institutions. 
But at the same time, in order to do this, you actually need to have a close collaboration with the people actually making the devices. There's no point doing materials research at the university, and then you find, you know, some, you know, have some brilliant insight if that is completely disconnected from the technology that's actually being used to make the, the processes. So I think we're probably going to need to move towards the same model they have in, say, the semiconductor industry, where you have big players that are making the processors, but they're still working closely with academic groups who are looking into very specific problems. Um, and we're not quite there yet, but I think that ecosystem is, is starting to emerge. Freke, did you want to add any anything more to, to, to that? Well, yeah, I, I completely agree that these challenges are really on top of list to, to tackle. And uh, what I see is that uh, when you look at the landscape now, some industries are so focused on uh, delivering the next chip and the next bigger uh, uh, system uh, that uh, there is maybe not enough uh, emphasis on the underlying challenges as we are discussing them now. For instance, better materials, better qubits themselves. And uh, I see that as a, as, as, as a challenge, like how will this proceed? Because if things happen in industry, there's a tendency to have a short term sort of milestones, like delivering new uh, uh, systems instead of also working on the underlying uh, physics of things that maybe need uh, a longer time horizon. So. Uh, it's interesting to see how this will develop, and I would be much in favor of also having this public-private uh, consortia working on these deeper laying challenges that also companies can work on together. I mean, better materials will help anyone uh, in the sector and doesn't need to be done uh, in one company specifically. Okay, um, Sadik, any, anything else to add? I, I think every, no, really not. Okay, no, no problem. Um, so the group that I work for within BA Systems, our, our role is to explore how emerging technologies, whether they're AI, machine learning, or quantum technologies, how they, can they be exploited to support quite disruptive business ap applications. And many of the questions I get from the people I'm talking to within my organization and my clients is, how will it happen? What, if, if, I'm, if, if I'm an end user in an end user organization, is there gonna be some kind of handbook of quantum solutions that I could piece together? Um, what can those solutions do? Um, and then, how will I piece them together in some some system? So I, I, I keep on getting this question. So so will there be a library of solutions, a handbook um, that that we as non quantum experts could at least somehow investigate how we can piece together and engineer some solution? That's a little bit more top down, um, and it's painting a picture in the future. Do you see something like that happening, that there will be these libraries of solutions, these handbooks, these these graphical engineering tools that allow you to put, I need to put quantum in there. I need to put quantum in another part because it will allow the solution to grow. Um, so I'll come to each of you just to see what your thoughts are. How do you see our, our community will develop and, and what could the end users of the future what could they? What what collateral will they have to to help them engineer these solutions? Um, I'll go to Tobias since uh, he's been on the phone for a while. I think as an end user, ultimately you don't care, right? I mean, you want to solve the problem you have at hand, and you want to solve that in 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 a in a in a way that's you know can be you know as quickly as possibly possibly, and and also. Um, in a cost-efficient manner. So I suspect we're going to be, you know, once we have a commercial ecosystem and you can actually sort of you know, either buy a quantum computer or use some cloud-based service, quantum computers is just going to end up being another high-performance computing solution. It's going to be similar to maybe what you have now with, with GPUs, right, these graphical, graphical processing units, which 
um, originally were made for computer games, but then now have found in a widespread use in AI, for example. But as an end user, if you're trying to do an AI application, all you, you don't care what's, how that is done on the hardware side. All you know that in certain parts of your program, you can offload these operations to a, G, a, a GPU, and that's much faster than trying to solve it on the CPU. So in the future, we're probably going to have that we have you know, some problem running still running best on, on a classical computer, and that's still going to be the majority. We're going to have some things that run best on a GPU. We have going to somehow some things run on a FPGA. But what's going to be added to that is the, the some things going to be run best on a quantum computer. And you're going to have you know, some algorithms where are using all of these resources. I mean, I don't think we should get too focused on having a quantum computer problem. I mean, that's not how it works. The real world, in the real world, you know, you want to solve your problem efficiently. Um, and whether or not it's quantum, who cares, ultimately? I mean, I care because I'm a scientist and I think it's interesting, but as an end user, why would you care? Good point, good point. Um, uh, Fadik, I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. um, uh... Uh, yeah, I totally agree with what uh, Tobias has just said, and I also like uh, you, the picture that Roberto, you have just uh, painted uh, very much of these little modules that will develop into a library. And mm -hmm. I actually think we are at the beginning of this happening. And of course, right now, those components are very small, and we are so strongly limited by the number of qubits and quantum volume that there's not really much we can do. But uh, what I'm observing is that uh, people are trying really hard uh, to, to make useful modules today with a focus on uh, quantum chemistry to come up with specialized quantum processors that have uh, application-specific designs, so to say, and so that even with a very small quantum volume, with Q, few Q, with already a few noisy qubits, you can try and do something useful. And now these will be very application specific, very problem specific. But uh, I can very well see that a library of uh, you know, this is for this chemistry problem, this is for that chemistry problem. I, I see it growing in there, and uh, that. I, I expect there will be publications in the years to come where one of these little functions will be uh, demonstrated after the other. And uh, I think there's a whole lot of um, theoreticians that are just hungry to uh, get their algorithms on, on, on these problem-specific uh, efforts. Um, yeah, so I really do like that picture, and I, I think this is also how it comes, how it will develop, first with very small ones, noisy, and then gradually over many years developing into bigger things. And then, of course, uh, the end user hitting a simulation button shouldn't know what's happening and what's going on and shouldn't, probably cannot even understand have the, cap the the time to really uh, learn how everything's going on. It will be abstracted. I think that's uh, that's also a very clear point. Great, thanks, Adi. Um, Freka, would you like to add any, anything else? Well, I, I I would say that everything has been said. I completely agree. I mean, it will take time, but in the end, this will be just like another uh, technology where an end user just has a user interface that is really user friendly and the, the hard stuff is uh, on the back end, so to say. And in that sense, I like the comparison to the high performance uh, computing uh, industry. So uh, most likely, or in my view, it could develop into something like that. And before we are there, it will uh, be like Sadiq is saying, uh, more specific machines uh, with specific application for specific industries. Uh, and yeah, we are trying to develop that now with some end users that are really, you know, uh, uh, in front of the game and uh, they will lead the way and others will follow. That's great, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to probe a little bit more now about some of the market opportunities and the different kinds of end users. I want to try and maybe get your perspectives on 
which markets do you see are going to benefit the soonest or the greatest or whichever way you want to look at it, uh, from quantum in their areas? Which markets, maybe what kinds of end users even, um, um, not just the markets? Um, you know, who, who do you think is going to benefit the most in the near term? And if you wish to explore, and then others maybe in the medium and long term. Um, let, me, uh, let me go to Tobias to start with. Um, my best guess, yes, is as has already been mentioned, is you know the applications in chemistry. So you could see um, companies that are involved in biomed biomedical research or catalysis or applications like that, where you know they have very important problems that are extremely hard or completely intractable even um, on classical computers and they are very interested in, in, in using quantum computers to solve these. And I think another sector where you can see, I'm, I'm almost hesitating to say where you see a real advantage, but I can see getting involved very early on is the financial sector, so fintech, because they tend to be very, um, you know, if you find a solution, even if it's a 1% improvement, it can be of interest to them. So they, they, they are very, uh, and, and they tend to have quite a lot of capital behind them. So they are willing to invest for even very, very, you know, small improvements in performance. So if I were to guess, I would say probably, you know, in chemistry and then also in the financial sector. Um, uh, I'll do it to Freka. Freka next. Well, I agree with these sectors uh, that Tobias mentions, and I would like to add one, and that's the public sector, because uh, I think in general, real new, big, groundbreaking technologies that really need a lot of uh, funding to get it developed in the first place, you see a lot of, uh, well, public investments and also public end users. Uh, if you look at the history of, for instance, the Internet and computing in general, uh, and if you read all the stuff Mariana Matsukato is, is saying, the economist who is uh, specialized in innovations, then I would not uh, uh, rule out the public sector. So I think things in the maybe security domain, uh, 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 securing uh, 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 critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, uh, stuff like that, I think there will be big uh, applications there to, to be expected. Great. And um, Sadiq, your thought, but also maybe if you could just add um, in, in identifying some of those sectors and market sectors, how, how, how will that affect um, the way we develop our quantum system? But, but first of all, what kind of sectors do you, do you see as the ones near term, medium term? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, what has been said, and um, uh, what's what I believe is really important, and what will dominate in the years to come is this is the uh, the chemistry, the simulation sector there, where uh, just because it's the next thing, very likely the next, the first thing we can reach and make it make a change. Um, now. Um, how, how, what, how, how can this play out? <clears throat> um, when as the rig instruments, we are very much at the forefront. Whenever somebody's trying something, trying to push quantum computing in a new direction, we typically learn quite early. And uh, the things that we learn early is that chemistry is going on. And then another sector that Freak has kind of touched just on uh, is uh, intelligence, of course, uh, you know, database search, intelligence. And I'm not saying that uh, the impact here is around the corner, but what I'm seeing is that the uh, willingness to invest uh, and put money behind this is very big. And I think as long as there's a chance that that will work in the years to come, uh, that will stay like that. And of course, especially with America leading the pack there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, um, so uh, we're, we're getting to a, a last couple of questions before we open it up to, to the rest of the audience. Um, I'm keen to understand whether there is a role for grand challenges, grand challenge experiments, grand challenge exercises and, and tests. I don't know if you're aware of some of the DARPA grand challenges that have occurred over the last 20 years that have taken emerging technologies and trialled them. There was, there was one in the... Um, I think it was in the Nevada desert to do with autonomous systems. And as a result of that, it actually stimulated quite a lot of industry work in that area. Do you see either the need or the benefit from having a few key grand challenges in the quantum domain? And first of all, and if so, um, have you got a grand challenge in mind that you would suggest? Um, I'm going to go to Freka first and then Tobias and then Sadiq. Well, I really like the, the format of such an approach because it uh, unifies uh, a challenge for the whole field and it also then it can add value in uh, on something we discussed uh, earlier in this panel, the standardization, right? Like if you uh, come up with a grand challenge and the field is working on that, then that can become uh, input for standardization as well. And it is very inspiring. So I would I would be very much in favor of introducing these kind of grand challenges. And I think topics uh, that we can uh, yeah, formulate things like that already were on the table, for instance, in the material science or in the user interfaces or in. So I think there are a lot of engineering grand challenges that we can uh, uh, formulate and it's it's something that we should work on together as uh, sort of institutions to to do that right uh Elias, what what are your thoughts on that no i agree i think you have to be a bit careful though i mean i think uh, there are there's certainly a role for challenges but i'm not entirely sure we need you know they can't be too grand because they i think they become can easily become too unfocused so again in my own area which is mainly on materials you can say okay let's have a grand challenge let's say we want to make you know say superconducting qubits as an example let's say we want to make a superconducting qubit with a coherence time of one millisecond and it's reproducible to what you know using whatever metric you you want right um, and that's the kind of challenge you can have i think if you have a grand challenge you know build a quantum computer that can solve a chemistry problem there are so many strands you have to target i mean it's it's going to be very difficult to focus that that effort um that said i mean there's another another aspect of this and an interesting model. Um, it was announced um, just the other day that the VTT wants to buy a quantum computer. So they have a budget of, I think, 20 million euro, and they just gonna, you know, basically pay a company to deliver a five qubit, you know, quantum computer to them. And that's not really a challenge as such, but it's certainly a way of stimulating innovation because you're basically telling someone, look, you need you need to put all the pieces together. And then deliver something that can we can actually use for whatever they want to use it for. I think that could be quite be of interest, um, you know, to you know, because you can see sort of I know collaborations between different different SM, different SMEs, for example, uh, coming together because there is a tangible goal for them to actually deliver something, which is not quite there yet in many cases. Sadiq, uh, what would you like to add there? Yeah, so personally, I'm very much uh, in favor of having these grand challenge uh, projects going on. I find them, those are the ones that can give a big push to a, certain, to, to a field. Um, I also see that uh, it can be too early for such grand challenges. And the way I see it is what's happening in Europe is very much the opposite. So we have this quantum flagship going on and it's very unspecific, very untargeted. And instead of putting out, you know, build a 200 qubit computer, nobody said that. It's this, this is not what it's primary, what it's aimed for. What it's aimed for is to strengthen the community, to build the network and all these things. And I believe they are important. And this is what I see have going on in Europe a lot. And Whereas in America, you see much more the 
build an error corrected qubit. This is the challenge. Do it. Make a small consortium. Networking is secondary. Build up the technology. And I think we need both. I think we do need both. Yes, we need to be prepared for a future quantum industry where we need to have the underlying community and the networks and all that. But we also need to make those a bit elitarian pushes that really push the technology in 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 small, concentrated, well-funded teams to the limits and beyond. And I'd like to actually see both. Right. And I think Europe, for example, should have such a project where they say, do you, like a well-funded project where a small team uh, can run as fast as they can to, I don't know, say, build the 200 qubit uh, quantum processor, for example, but of course, it can also be another thing. Great. Well, Sadiq, thank I you very much. I completely agree with uh, Sadiq. For instance, yeah. build a quantum repeater, something like that, like really where you can work on together and not too big, not too grand, but focused. Uh, I think that's needed. Great. Um, so what yeah. we're going to do at this stage, we're, we're going to conclude this part of the panel where we're having the discussion together. And uh, we're going to open it up to the audience. And hopefully people will have highlighted a number of questions. And I'll pick some questions and I'll, I'll uh, pass them on to each of you in turn. So uh, uh, open it up to the audience now. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that uh, session so far. Um, we've got uh, some questions just coming online now, which I'll feed through to some of the panelists. We've had one from um, David Shaw from Fact Based Insight, who was highlighting that uh, yesterday was mentioned the importance of sovereign capability for quantum computing. And he wanted to get a feel for what are the elements of the stack of the technology where where our know-how, maybe national know-how, must, must be managed carefully? Uh, will this impede free collaboration? So um, let me go to Freka first and see whether Freka, what do you think about that on the importance of uh, sovereign capability and how this might affect things and how well it be managed? Hello? Uh, if Freak is not able to answer that, uh, how about um, Sadiq? Could you answer that? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, I, I would hear actually you. like to answer that one. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. So uh, we do export into the entire world. So export regulations. I think that's the key word here. Export regulations. That's what is going to limit uh, the technology going around. And uh, I think it's quite clear it will. It does not yet, but it will start on the on the bottom in the with the quantum processor. This is where the magic happens. This is where the exponential growth and capability is. So uh, once and I do expect we will come to this point. Uh, this reaches a level where it becomes dangerous in terms of cryptography, for example. Uh, there will be American export, European export regulations, and this is where it will start. And then I don't know at what rate and what to what extent it will also cover higher parts of the stack, but definitely the quantum CPUs, the technology used on there, that will become uh, very, very much uh, a, a dangerous good and will be regulated. I expect that. Great. Tobias, did you want to add anything to that? I think it's um I think there are there are several possible answers to that. I mean it it depends on if it start to, if you only consider sort of national security or if you think about, you know, um enterprises limiting access to competitors, for example. Um so it's um I'm not worried in, you know, I think in the next few years, we're probably going, not going to be a huge issue on the sort of national security front because the computers are simply not advanced enough. But you could see a situations where um, 
companies with direct access to hardware will have a huge advantage on, on the, uh, you know, even on the software side because they basically can optimize their code much better than the competitors. That's the, that's the uh, that would be my answer to that. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if Freyke is back online. Freyke, did did you want to add anything to this one? Maybe Freyke is not on the line at the moment. Okay. Let me um, let me pose a different question. We we did sort of briefly discuss earlier on uh, the notion of designing, testing, evaluating hybrid systems that have a quantum component. But I want to get to the next stage um, of certifying, certifying a system that has a quantum component, whether it's a quantum sensor in a navigation and tracking system or, uh, or whatever, whatever component. What problems do you see in getting to that, that this stage of how would we certify a system? How would we certify that it can do what it's meant to do? Maybe a safety critical system. Um, has there been enough thought about it so far? Um, and what have you heard? So actually, I'm going to come to Tobias first, because I think from MPL, you may have uh, some views on this. Tobias, what do you think? It's something we're thinking about quite a lot. And I think there's a lot of active research in the, going on. Um, I think uh, if you go to certification, it's I think ultimately the, the only way you know, so the, the obvious way is, is to um, create sort of to have some sort of toy problem that you're trying to solve or, or a sort of a test system because it's I think we're never going to be able to with these complicated systems we're never going to be able to certify from the bottom up I think what we're probably looking at is something similar to have on classical hardware where you create a standardized benchmark sort of test suites um, that you then you know run on your system or you then try out and then you, you make you try to you know did you know you do the best you can and you basically try to verify that it's doing what it says on the tin um, but yeah, it's, I think it's a very hard problem and it's something we will need to consider very, very carefully over the next few years. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sadiq, have you got any, any things to add to that? Yeah, maybe I can add something complementary to that. Uh, and that is not so much, well, where, where are we really busy today? Uh, so for example, we are now looking into how we can better characterize the classical part of the quantum computer. So just the cryo connection, the cryo cabling, the cryo amplifiers and all that uh, so that we can get it like that kind of the first step. And this is something that's happening now and we're working on this. Uh, Blue Force and uh, also with ETH uh, Zurich, we have a project going on there where we're actually looking into this. And I think that's kind of the first step and definitely a lot of work to go into this direction. Thank, thank you very much, Sadiq. Um, another question more to do with training and education, in particular about making sure that we've got the right kinds of engineers who can, who can design systems that have quantum components in them. Um, how will we get these, our engineers trained to understand quantum in its many forms? Uh, will that, what do you, how do you think that could happen? Which, is it going to be through short courses, continuing education, or, or do we have to wait for these to come into bachelor programs and master's programs? Um, I'll ask Tobias, and then maybe Frank will be on the line, but let me get to Tobias. What are your thoughts on that? I think the, I mean, in the UK, there is now a, um, a lot of activities related to creating what's sometimes known as quantum aware engineers. Um, because typically, as has already been mentioned, I mean, many of the problems you have when you're trying to build a system are not act and have nothing to do with quantum mechanics. You're not solving, you know, Schrodinger equations. It's RF problems, it's system integration, it's electronics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for many of these things, what you're really looking for are probably people who might even have worked for a few years in, say, the telecom sector or something similar, who have an interest in quantum and know enough about it to realize that there's the skills they already have are applicable to this area. So whereas I agree that there is a need to train more people, I mean, at the most undergraduate and postgraduate level, um, I think we shouldn't, you know, we should be careful about just saying yeah, we need to train more PhDs because that's not, you know, that's not going to solve all problems. You're going to need staff in, in a wide, with a, wide, a very wide variety of, of specialities. Um, and, and many of these are, you know, not going to require that much knowledge about quantum mechanics, to be frank. Yeah. Um, uh, Sadiq, have you got any additional thoughts on that? Oh, yes. 
Um, so this is a this need has been uh, 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 there's a couple of universities and networks that have uh, this uh, seen identified that there's a big need. And because we are active on the industry side of the quantum uh, in the, of the quantum community, um, we get some exposure there. So, for example, I know that we co-sponsor a PhD student at University College London, uh, and this is an electrical engineer. So he does not come at, with a physicist background. Then there's another program going, which is a master's in physics at ETH Zurich, which uh, is very popular. The attendance is uh, very significant, almost overrun. Uh, so there the background is typically physicists. And uh, there again, we, we like this a lot because uh, we are growing. We, we can, for us, this is also a hiring channel. And then I also observed that networks, for example, the Chicago Quantum Network in America, uh, that's a big topic. And I also see that the academia has identified this problem on a bit of an abstract level. And I think they are also struggling a bit in the sense that the industrial counterpart is just about to be forming now. And this is why we at Zurich Instruments um, get in touch with these uh, initiatives quite early on because the industry is simply just developing. Great, Thank, thanks, uh, Sadiq. Um, I think I, it's I'm also online, on the line. Maybe, yes, yes, I think yeah. maybe there were some technical difficulties, but I, I'm here, yeah. hi. Uh, I think this is a very important issue to get uh, new engineers and, and, and train the new workforce for this new technology. And I completely agree it's it's not only PhDs or uh, not even only uh, bachelor and master uh, uh, trainings. I mean, we are developing those and I think it's important that, that we do that uh, around the world. But also, uh, yeah, technicians that don't need to learn the Schrodinger equation but can uh, connect the, the the fridges or uh, work with the qubits. And I think this is really one of the biggest challenges we should uh, put our heads to in the next uh, couple of years. Also, open the labs uh, for people who want to yeah, experiment with the technology, try it out. Uh, uh, yeah, you need to, to, to open it up because not all students like to study quantum mechanics and like to uh, uh, publish uh, complex papers, but a lot of students just want to work uh, with the technology, and that's we should uh, get that talent on board too. Great, and, and in fact, um, Freika, maybe we're, we're just about to finish. If you would you like to add any closing thoughts? Uh, well, I think uh, this was a very good panel to address a broad range of uh, what's needed to uh, to do the engineering to bring it further and the system and integration. And I think, yeah, the the, the key message uh, is, in my view, it's collaboration and uh, that no party can do this alone. It's really a big challenge uh, over the whole range of, of, of engineering uh, problems that we still have. So we should keep the field open that is my uh, my main message i think that's a, a really good way to to finish the panel especially on this so i thank you all uh, panelists for for your responses to the questions and i hope the rest of you in the audience have enjoyed this panel so thank you very much bye